Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to all our attendees. I'm very happy you could join us today for this session on rebooting supply chain considerations. My name is Bridget Maloney. I am the Managing Director of JEDI at the University of Waterloo. JEDI is the gateway for enterprises to discover innovation at Waterloo. The University of Waterloo is proud to host this webinar. It's the second in a six-part panel series. As we all know, COVID-19 has shaken the world, challenging societies and altering life as we know it. But from this crisis, opportunities have emerged, calling us to action as we prepare to reboot from this COVID-19 lockdown. How we work and behave, how society and the economy will function, and how we innovate and educate will change. Plotting the future for Canada, your enterprise, and yourself is complicated and challenging. Our researchers and university partners are happy to share their research and perspectives. So just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have a question for our panel, please send it via the WebEx Q&A. So click Q&A in the bottom right corner of your window and uh, ensure to choose all panelists before typing. Um, and please know that your question will only be seen by the um, folks who are coordinating the uh, webinar. They will not be seen by the full audience. This event is being recorded and will be uploaded to the official U Waterloo YouTube channel. So now I would like to move to introduce our moderator, Larry Smith. Larry is adjunct associate professor, Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business, and also director of the University of Waterloo Problem Lab. So Larry, over to you. Much Bridget. Uh, we welcome all the participants to a panel discussion on supply chain management during the pandemic and after. Uh, for much of the world, of course, supply chain management does not make their heart beat with excitement. Much of the public does not even know what goes on. They don't think it's interesting. They would prefer to listen to much more glamorous subjects. However, for those of us who are interested in supply chain management, indeed, in my, in my case, fascinated by them, we're well aware that some of the most glamorous technology products created would be indispensable without the global supply chains. So that's why this is a vital subject. And to those of us who are interested, an important and intriguing subject, and we believe our audience is going to share that interest. We're gonna to try to share some key observations in this brief period of time about the peculiar challenges we face and some of the other longer term issues that affect supply chain. Now these global supply chains are an um, intricate web of relationships that surround the world. They're the embodiment, the an embodiment of the global economy, a clear manifestation of it. They are extraordinarily complex. Some components, for instance, can cross several borders several times before they end up in the finished product. They come with a powerful benefit, which is why they have been created. They provide, in many cases, the most efficient way to produce a wide range of, of goods and in fact, some services as well. It's also the, excuse me, it's also the case that there are some products that as a practical matter cannot be created without the global supply chains. So essential without any doubt. But they also come with inherent challenges the complexity, for example, often produces instability. It produces unintended consequences. There are management challenges of all kinds. They're also subject to disruption. Any kind of disruption, weather can disrupt them as a matter of fact, if the weather event is at a critical node of the supply chains. They also come with significant social in environmental consequences, which should not be ignored as we pursue efficient global scale manufacturing, for example. Lots of issues, lots of challenges. That existed before the pandemic. The pandemic, of course, which is a major disruption, is stressing the system out and calling for a response. 
one of the great weaknesses of all supply chains is their vulnerability to disruption of various kinds, including the geopolitical maneuvering of governments around the world, as if there weren't enough uh, opportun uh, occasions for that disruption. But the pandemic is an extra level that is now applied to this issue. I'm pleased to be joined by a distinguished panel of uh, Waterloo experts in supply chain, and also one external guest. At this time, I would like to introduce our panelists. I'm going to begin with our visitor from Amazon. I'd like to introduce you to Rohan uh, Gupte. Rohan's background, he has spent the past 14 years career working in supply chain uh, design, logistics, warehousing operations. He joined Amazon in January of last year and has been focused on the Canadian market, managing their supply chain execution. And specifically, he is part of the uh, sales and organizations unit at Amazon that is responsible for new fulfillment centers in Canada and the appropriate uh, facilitation of the existing network of fulfillment centers in uh, for Amazon in Canada. Uh, welcome, Rohan, to the panel. Thank you, Larry. Our second uh, uh, panelist I'll introduce is Dr. Fatma Grazara. She's Associate Professor in the Department of Management Sciences. Uh, and co-director of the Waterloo Analytics and Optimization uh, Lab. Her primary research interests are in supply chain analytics and large-scale optimization. Her current research focuses on improving supply chain operations using data-driven approaches, the analytics of emerging technologies in logistics and distribution like crowdsource and, de and drone delivery and the optimization of systems operating in uncertain environments. We certainly do have uncertain environments. There would be hard any way to argue that. Recently, she has led several industry collaborations on data analytics and optimization founded by NSERC, the Ontario Centers of Excellent, MITAX, and other industry collaborators like Bombardier, Unilever, uh, and others. Uh, welcome, Fatma. Our uh, third panelist is, is Dr. Jatin Nathawani. He is the executive director of the Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Energy. He is professor of civil and environmental engineering and also professor in management sciences in, and in environmental engineering. He's currently leading a global change initiative, Affordable Energy for Humanity to address the challenge of enabling universal access. The fo focus of this global collaborative effort involves leading universities around the world. The twin goals are to drive scientific and technological innovation required for energy uh, trans uh, transitions, to cleaner low carbon energy systems and to deliver affordable energy to the vast proportion of humanity that is minimal access to electricity, and modern fuels for basic needs. Welcome to team. Okay. We're also pleased to welcome Olaf Weber, who is professor in the School uh, of Environment, Enterprise and Development, SEED, in the Faculty of the Environment. In addition, he holds the position of the University of Waterloo's Research Chair in Sustainable Finance and is Senior Fellow with Innovation Governance um, Innovation, uh, CG. His research and teaching interests address the connection between financial sector players, such as banks and sustainable development, and the link between sustainability and financial performance of enterprises. His research focuses on the impacts of the financial industry on sustainable development, the role of voluntary and regulatory mechanisms, for the materiality of sustainability risks and opportunities for investors and artificial intelligence as a tool to analyze environmental, social, and governance performance. Thank well, you, Larry. Thank you. 
I'd like to begin by asking our panel several uh, questions. We'll rotate among the panel. And we'll, of course, comment on their colleagues' observations. And then, of course, we will invite the Q&A that Bridget spoke about as we, um, as we conclude. I'd like to address my first question to Rohan Gupte to really start with the basic issues that he thinks face us. Rohan, what are some of the current supply chain challenges faced due to the pandemic? In other words, what's broken and what may need to be fixed? Rohan? That's a good one to start off, uh, Larry. Thanks for having me. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all the audience and viewers who have joined us. Uh, appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, take a bit of an exception to your comments, Larry, that I sincerely love supply chain and this is what I do and I love what I do. So uh, to those who don't understand supply chain and don't see the, the thrill of it, uh, feel sorry for them. <laughs> uh, with that out of the way, uh, in terms of challenges, um, if you think about it, like it's probably an understatement to say uh, supply chains in general, both long and short, domestic or global, are facing like considering ch considerable challenges in this uh, current pandemic. So supply chain, if I just think of Amazon as an example, uh, supply chains at Amazon are pretty complex uh, with a lot of like crisscross of, of systems and technology and people, uh, infrastructure. But for the sake of this discussion, to just break it down, the supply chain into three or three main components, I would say, uh, starting with the customers. Uh, we like to start everything with the customers. That's our number one key component of the supply chain. So uh, let's start there. And then just building one layer top of that. The second one I can think of is our Amazon fulfillment network or our FC network, as we like to call it, uh, with obviously all the infrastructure that comes with it. Uh, fulfillment centers, or all we can call them FCs, delivery stations, our transportation carriers, uh, obviously our associates who work in the warehouses, the whole nine yards. And then the last piece of the supply chain, as I see it, is our upstream partners, uh, our vendors or our suppliers who basically inject their product into our, our fulfillment network, uh, we in turn use to fulfill our customer demand. So let's look at those three components one by one quickly here. Uh, starting with the customer, uh, obviously, given the recent stay home orders through uh, the government officials, our customers have come to rely more and more on companies such as Amazon as they have shifted some of the buying patterns from the brick and mortar stores to more of an online uh, buying pattern. So, which obviously is a good for business, especially in an important market for us such as Canada. Uh, but with that, obviously, come some changes in demand signals. Um, the type of products our customers are looking to buy online, uh, that has changed. Uh, the scale of it is, has changed. And obviously that has that has created some degree of volatility, if you can imagine, uh, in our existing supply chain. So let's start there. That, the, the second piece, just to overlay on top of it, on the back end of it, so how do you like fulfill all this demand that is being created by the customers who want more and more stuff and more and more stuff quickly um, and buying it online? So the, we, we, we sort of had to like modify and change our ways as to how we interact and, and, and information share with our partners upstream. Uh, may that be sellers or vendors uh, to make sure they are sort of picking up the right signals as to which product they should be inbounding into our network, uh, which in turn we can use to fulfill our customer orders. So there are, there are cha changes and challenges we are seeing there uh, with regards to longer lead times, uh, fulfillment issues from their perspective, and just in the middle of all of this, the, 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 the hot spot of action, if you will, is our own fulfillment center network where we are trying to obviously keep the FCs running at full capacity uh, at the same time while keeping our employees safe, uh, creating an, 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 an environment that is scalable, so hiring the right amount of people, training them, uh, making sure the infrastructure around them from a system standpoint scales along with it. So a lot of challenges, just a mishmash of things. Um, and it's, you know, I wish there was like a silver bullet to say, here's what you do in a situation like COVID. Well, guess what? We haven't found one. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a lot of grinding, if you will. It's a lot of like trying to solve each problem individually. 
and looking at the bigger picture and trying to solve the whole thing as a whole. Uh, but that's what we are seeing in terms of some of the challenges uh, in, 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 in supply chain in current times. Thank you very much, Rohan. Um, uh, comments from uh, other panelists? I will call on um, uh, my colleague, uh, Fatma, and ask, the, uh, ask her. COVID-19 is having a, a substantial challenge on the supply chains, uh, both locally and globally. What, are, what, what do you see as the main challenges and how best to respond to them. Some of these supply chains, of course, are essential involving food um, and other uh, high, high demand, high potential products. Fatma? Thanks, Larry, and uh, thanks, Rohan. Uh, it's good to hear um, the challenges from the people who experience them day in and day out. Um, so um, what you said, I totally agree with what you said. I, I can appreciate the challenges that you, Amazon, and you are going through. And I'm going to uh, reiterate some of those, uh, but in, from a general point of view, to answer the question that Larry just posed. And so to understand uh, the impact of the pandemic on the supply chains, it is helpful to put things in perspective. Um, if we think about recent history, uh, supply chains have experienced disruptions for example, um, in 2011, the tsunami in Japan caused uh, big disruptions to the automotive industry. And as Larry mentioned, uh, geopolitical uh, crises or events uh, happen all the time. Uh, but um, these disruptions are generally local uh, or at best regional. Uh, they may have happened unexpectedly, but experts were able to predict time to recovery and these disruptions are generally short-lived. Uh, so now thinking about what's going on with the pandemic, none of these conditions is true. Uh, supply chains are experiencing disruptions like never before. They are exper experiencing, like Rohan said, uh, supply shocks, demand shocks, and processes shocks. So pro disruptions in distribution and production. Uh, for example, think of the automotive industry. Just to complement what Rohan said about the about Amazon, which is more on e-retailing. Um, earlier, when the lockdown started in China, companies in Europe and North America started to reduce capacity, uh, production capacities in response to uh, shortages in supplies. Uh, and that was as early as February and March. But then come lockdowns in Europe, um, and North America, which forced uh, large scale production closures and significant drop in demand with consumers being wary of uh, big spending. So we see here that the automotive industry uh, experienced uh, in a very short period of time, um, shocks in supply, uh, in processes and in demand. For example, uh, in Canada, uh, the Supply Chain Canada, the Association Supply Chain Canada, they surveyed their membership and uh, in their responses, they found that 72% um, responded that their supply chains were disrupted, that being local or global supply chains. And these are mainly due to shortage in supply, uh, reduced access to PPE, uh, pro uh, personal protective e uh, equipment, believe it or not, um, and some unplanned spending, um, you know, because of all of what's going on. And in response to how resilient they judge their supply chains to be, 24% um, say that they have resilient supply chains uh, because they are able to conduct scenario planning, because they're able to shift sourcing and capacity and distribution. Uh, but then 62%, they said that they only focus on uh, managing disruptions once they occur. So you can imagine this is, this is ad hoc and it can create chaos. So now to answer the question of how to respond to these challenges in the short to medium term. Of course, there are the standard strategies um, like diversify your suppliers, especially geographically, uh, reposition inventories and manage labor and production capacities uh, optimally uh, to try and uh, match uh, the supply with demand, whatever supply and demand you have, that could be, there is of course, um, 
huge imbalances, and that could be because there is lots of supply, little demand, or huge demand, little supply. So both are 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 there. Um, so, for example, let's uh, think of the famous uh, uh, example of toilet paper. Uh, toilet paper is an otherwise perfectly predictable consumer product, um, but with all the volatility in the demand, um, which people cannot explain, uh, the forecasting systems will most likely misread these demands, um, the demand variations, and prescribe re replenishment strategies uh, that will probably uh, cause uh, more damage, for example, by um, introducing um, bullwhip uh, effects. So um, then what, what should uh, companies do? Sh companies should think of out-of-the-box strategies and out-of-the-box ways to deal with these um, unusual um, events. Uh, for example, um, they should allow for strategies that enable employees to override uh, system decisions um, so that they can respond to the dynamic and uncertain, uncertain environments that uh, they're operating in. This is uh, especially true for uh, food supply chains. Um, companies also need to set priorities and to manage whatever supply they have uh, to ensure cash flow, because without cash flow, there's no business. Um, companies also should consider repurposing their capabilities. Uh, for example, you all heard about uh, how apparel manufacturers are turning their um, um, production plants to uh, make protective garments. Um, and in Canada, for example, GM is uh, making 100 million, uh, sorry, 10 million masks over the next few months uh, to um, help with the demand of masks in Canada. So this repurposing, of course, is in itself a challenge because uh, in this case, with all of the uncertainty that there is, you are also revisiting the whole operation. You are revisiting product specifications, you are revisiting processes, schedules, uh, and storage and distribution uh, requirements, etc. Um, so it is time that companies resort to rigorous modeling of their supply chains. Under these volatile conditions, optimizing the supply chain can make a difference between faring well or going out of business. So mapping the supply chain network and the supplier network, identifying major risk nodes and links, and allocating resources to optimally match supply and demand is key. And that is what we do at the Waterloo Analytics and Optimization Lab. We can optimize the supply chain and we can simulate it under a range of scenarios to determine the best courses of action and um, determine where, when to do what. Thank you. Thank you. Um, clearly, the, these issues involve some of the great themes of humanity. How, do, how are you resilient when you respond to shocks? How do you create innovations to facilitate adaptation? And the fact that there's a limit to the speed of any organization or person's ability to adapt. Uh, so those are those are those are key themes. And also, Fatma, I like I like your concluding comments because um, you the companies either get this right or they will fail. So you know the the danger of uh, death tomorrow tends to focus people's attention. So presumably this will aid um, the innovations that will be necessary to add resilience to the system. Happy to, um, are the panelists wish to comment, please? Very well, I will uh, uh, now ask um, uh, uh, Jatin uh, to, uh, to respond um, to, uh, to this question. Um, as you consider the energy sector specifically in the context of supply chain, either nationally, regionally, or globally. Uh, can you comment on the six features of the system and identify some issues and challenges as we look ahead? Jatin? Thank you, Larry, and thank you, my panelists. Uh, let me begin with a well-known but uh, little understood example of a supply chain uh, that delivers a product absolutely central to our lives and it is probably the most stellar example of just-in-time delivery uh, that unfailingly meets uh, 
demand at an incredibly high level of reliability. You might wonder what I'm talking about. I'm talking about electricity, the vast integrated power network that is designed, built, and operated on the premise that what is required for consumption now must be produced at that very instant. There is no warehouse, there is no storage. Laws of physics actually dictate power generation and transmission and that in turn has determined the, both the business models of the industry and its regulation, safety, and controls. This incredibly complex system that delivers electricity in Canada and the United States is actually a continent-wide, fully integrated system that has been built over the past century, comprising, uh, in essence, three large independent uh, synchronous systems that together span the lower 48 lower states, much of Canada and some of Mexico. Each one of these is the largest integrated synchronous machine in the world. Now, these integrated grids have of course achieved significant uh, efficiency with, with increasing scale, uh, as well as improved reliability uh, owing to redundant paths over which electricity can flow. So today, for example, power plants using either fossil fuels or nuclear energy or renewable energy supplies, these machines and move the power to consumers over thousands of kilometers of high voltage transmission lines and thousands more uh, kilometers of local distribution line. For example, the US National Academy of Engineering puts electrification at the top of the 10 most uh, important engineering achievements of the past century. In essence, as a society, we depend on electricity uh, to light our streets, control the flow of traffic, roads, trails, air, operate the myriad physical infrastructure and supply chains that create, produce, and distribute goods and services, maintain public safety, and help ensure our uh, national security. So what are the, the hallmarks of this success? Well, on the technical side, it's the principles of contingency planning, redundancy, uh, real-time monitoring and control, all coordinated through central reliability councils uh, and a transparency of, transparency of actions uh, of all agents and uh, licensed participants in the system. Both regulated and market-based entities are, are participants and have a stake actually in the successful outcome uh, of, of what this system delivers. So for a system that has performed quite well, by and large, the emerging challenges actually relate to the changing nature of the supply mix. Uh, in essence, the emergence of low carbon generation uh, resources such as wind, solar, now electric mobility being integrated into the system, and the broader threats that emerge from climate-related st stress. This is the frequency of forest fires, heat waves, floods, hurricanes, storms, both increasing over time, and uh, the scale and magnitude of the threat uh, over wide areas. So from a reliability standpoint, it's been a stellar example of 99.9% .9 or a one day in a year outage. But reliability is not in my view, the same as resilience. Resilience is not the same as reliability because minimizing the, the, the likelihood of you know, large area outages, long duration outages is important. And of course, we need to begin to recognize that a resilient system is one that, that acknowledges that such events will occur, prepare to deal with them, minimize their impacts when they occur, is able to restore service quickly, and draws lessons from the experience to improve uh, performance in the future. Now, this concept of resilience is and has been a subject uh, that requires much more attention as we look to uh, a consideration of a more a resilient system that will, that will, that will serve the uh, broader uh, societal interest. Thank you. Thank you, Jatine. I live in rural Ontario and find electrical distribution particularly fascinating because you see in rural Ontario, I may not take it for granted 
um, the reliability and the, the challenge that you speak of, I I have to live through and make sure my um, you know stuff in the freezer doesn't melt. Um, but it's a serious issue, as 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 you rightly observe. Uh, we can lose um, electricity for the ridiculously simple reason that it snows, and the snow brings trees down. And in rural Ontario, the isolation of the power lines, of course, make them very vulnerable to weather weather events of all of all kinds. Uh, a windstorm in the summer will usually take my power out for um, several hours. Notwithstanding the redundancy, it is just you know the function of rural communities. And of course, it's also the truth that many communities around the world do not have reliable electricity of any kind, and therefore cannot cannot afford the you know modern attributes of what we would take to be a modern of, of a modern society, and they're deprived of all of that, with great you know personal and economic effect on them. So yeah, I I I, I cannot tell you I know much about the electrical system, but I understand it is a complex um, it's a complex system. And um, I, I appreciate its applicability this, uh, to, the, to the topic at hand. Um, comment from the other panelists? Fatma, please. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thanks, Jatin. Um, you know, the uh, way um, electricity supply chains operate is a dream for other supply chains. But of course, the type of commodity is different. So I'm not sure that's a dream that can come true. Uh, but I'm just wondering, um, what is the impact of the pandemic on the electricity supply chain or the energy supply chain in, in general? And how is it dealing with, um, is it experiencing waves because of the pand pandemic? And how is it dealing with those waves? Thank you for asking that question because somebody else asked me that the other day. How come the electricity system is doing so well when everything else in our society seems to be coming apart? Uh, the part of the answer is uh, that the system is not stressed. It's been extremely well designed and generally well operated, notwithstanding Larry's observation around, uh, you know, distribution link, uh, dis distribution part of the system is always weak and you see more, more frequent outages because of weather and so on. But um, there are two things. There's the big grid and then there's the distribution system, but the large scale area outages like the few events we've had over the number of decades are very infrequent. Uh, the system is not stressed, it's well designed, uh, it's uh, well below its reserve margins. Uh, um, and and this, I, I was a bit disingenuous when I said the system has no storage. Well, it doesn't in a physical sense, uh, and neither does it have a warehouse. But over the last century, we've learned how to design this system. So what we call reserve margin is de facto storage, if you think about it. And if you allow that reserve margin to drop both in its design and operation, you're in trouble. And so uh, uh, under the current circumstances, both the demand has dropped dramatically. As you can see, people are not working, industry is not working and so on. So the system is not stressed and is operating quite well. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, I will direct a, a question to our uh, fourth uh, panelist, uh, Olaf. Uh, so I'd like, uh, I'd like to begin uh, by asking how we can guarantee supply, excuse me, sustainable supply chain that's both environmentally and socially sustainable um, after the crisis. Um, thanks, uh, thanks, Larry. Um, um, yeah, very interesting question. And um, as I'm not a supply chain technology expert, I'm, I'm rather focusing on, on sustainability, human and environmental aspects. I want to focus on that here as well. So probably the first question we have to ask is why should we change anything? So the question of how can we guarantee that something works well after a crisis seems, you know, seems to show that something is not running very well before the crisis. So what is going wrong? And um, and I think in generally most of the problems probably are not really new, but they are accelerated and amplified. So we have the things that we know the, the weaknesses everywhere, um, but with this crisis we just realized that we have them. And um, so um, maybe from a more general perspective, to start with a more general perspective, what I wanted is um, since we can say since seventy five years we had time to run our economies in a very stable environment, more or less. So 
after the Second World War, there were not these big disruptions. And in the North America, probably even longer than 75 years. And what, what really struck me is now we have two or three months of, of, a, of an issue and everything is in turmoil. So weren't we not able to, you know, to, to, to kind of to, to, to run our economy in a way that we can kind of survive three or months or a year or half a year without having these, these, these big issues. And this goes back to resilience that Fatma mentioned and Jatin as well. So it looks like we try and over-optimize and over to be efficient. Um, but the problem with always being efficient is that we are not resilient because we cannot, cannot uh, create storage as, as Jatin said more or less. And so, um, but I think one main issue, and I will come back to that at the end as well, is, is, is uh, and also in the supply chain uh, that affects the environment and the society's externalization. And so we have an international supply chain that we need, there's no doubt about it. And that is really helpful. Um, we cannot produce most of the products and even services without a, a, a global, a global supply chain. But what we need to make sure is that all parts of the supply chain follow good environmental and social practices. We cannot, it cannot be that we purchase products that are produced. No, we know that there are children, slaves in, in some countries producing the, the basic commodities for our smartphones, textile production anywhere. So we mainly, we, we rely on a supply chain that is, is, is not just from a, from a human perspective and, and also from an environmental perspective. We know that we can buy goods that are that cheap because they create a lot of environmental pollution that is just externalized. And the society pays and, and, um, uh, at, the, at the end for that. So I think, you know, in general, what we need to do and that the crisis might be an opportunity to do so is increase standards, environmental and, and social standards. Um, that might pro increase prices, um, it, the first side for product and service, but at the end, I think it reduces environmental social damage that has also costs. So, and, and we should uh, maybe, maybe have a look on, on that. And you know, also having a look on the, on the human perspective as well. Rohan mentioned Amazon's challenges. You know, what you could also read in the news, there are, of course, there is the logistic, the technology is, is future technology. That's great. If you look on, on labor issues, that for me, that is rather the past. So we knew that there are people working uh, in, in storage, in logistic, there are no health um, safety measures, there are no sick payments if they, if they get sick and so on. And I think we should not rely on, on supply chains like that. I think that's a learning um, that we have from the, from the crisis and things that we can change. And I think, you know, it's probably cannot leave this to the market and hope that, they, that the market resolves the problem. We have COVID today, we had 2008 crisis. If we look on what changed after the 2008 crisis, even the, the basic problems in the financial industry have not been addressed. And really, we had massive environmental pollutions between 1950s to 1970s, 1980s even. The market never did, did not deliver a solution for that. So we needed standards, we need, we need regulations uh, or outside, outside pressure and that lead to political activity or, or other types of uh, of regulation um, or standards. And also, you know, nobody wants to talk about, uh, speak about taxes, but if, if, if we have to tax, if, 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 if uh, companies or anybody else externalize costs, so uh, someone has to pay for that. And we now see as well, because um, all of us are aware that we have to pay for all the, all the programs and stimulus that is, is, is conducted now. And so, so we need to realize that there are many negative consequences of, of supply chains. I mentioned something, textile um, um, or, or commodities for, for smartphones. Um, we can also look as, at ourselves. Canada is also a supplier very early in the supply chain. Um, what are the consequences? We produce and export a commodity that is one of the worst climate polluters, pollutes the local environment, the water, for example. And uh, you know what I'm talking about, it's the oil sand. So, we are in a situation that we, that we externalize these costs as well to be able to deliver, uh, to supply a product uh, to others. And 
And this is similar to what we see in the global supply chain as well. So, so uh, um, the suppliers are dependent on delivering for the lowest price. Um, the only way to, to do that is to, to slash environmental and social standards. And so, so that's the problem. And I think um, you cannot go back to localize everything, but we have to guarantee that we use social and environmental standards. For example, that every worker in all countries where we buy products uh, from has a has a living living wage, so that they can live from 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 the salaries they they have. And still, if they do that, we, it's still beneficial to have a global supply chain. It's not you know if we pay someone five dollars in Bangladesh instead of one, that's still it's still a good business uh, for for everybody, and and also increases the uh, the, the benefit for for the worker uh, for the worker there. And again, no, we have um, to go back to the resiliency. We cannot only focus on being efficient, I think. Now what we see is when I go shopping, now I only go to Zayas, that's 500 meters away, the supermarket. There's everything's closed. Usually I go to farmer's market and everywhere else. That's super efficient. But do we want to have that after the crisis? So if we do that, if we rely on Zayas and Amazon, I don't want to. Don't, don't say anything against Amazon, but if you only uh, to only rely on the big suppliers, everything else will be gone after the crisis. And the question is whether we want to do that. And also, what can we do to guarantee that we can go back after that as well? We see that you know, the big suppliers, probably for them, the crisis is financially relatively beneficial. The question is what they can do to help other suppliers to go back to business after the crisis as well. And again, it's an internal internalization of, uh, of of external costs that might be might be needed. You know, talking about taxes, payments, or, or something something like that uh, that can be used to uh, to support local businesses uh, after the after the crisis. So um, I don't say we have to get big. Of course, I don't say we have to get rid of big suppliers, but we have to make sure. That we still have a healthy supply chain after that as well. Nobody wants to have a, you know, monopolistic supply chains um, uh, uh, after after the crisis. So maybe my, my general statement on that is: um, What do we do to guarantee a, a, a sustainable uh, supply chain? Internalizing costs. We have to internalize environmental and social costs, and using indicators, regulations. Uh, payments, taxes to, to guarantee uh, that this process uh, will be conducted so that we internalize these costs in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, I'm a, an economist. Um, so, of course, I love talking about taxes. I find actually taxes even more fascinating with supply chains. Uh, and obviously, taxes is, is an important element of the, of the issue you speak of. Um, Given that uh, a variety of companies will be uh, somewhat challenged in this in this regard, um, I I would suspect uh, just a brief comment on I would I would anticipate quite a ferocious debate now erupting, since some companies may well call for relaxed standards because of the econ because of the recession. Would you comment just on that briefly? Sure, sure they will, and, and probably they they are right, and some are affected, and some are less affected. And I think we really have to think about how can we help those that are more affected. And there might be tax reduction. There are also people thinking about you know just averaging the income of the last two years instead of just one year for tax payments. These are measures that that we could do, but we also have to make sure that not those go for these incentives and stimulus programs that have a higher income during the crisis anyway. And so it's, it's, it's not easy to do that. We have to be probably relatively flexible in, 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 in doing that. And uh, because at the end, you know, it's nice if, 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 if Trudeau and all the, all, all the heads of, of government say, you know, we provide this money for these and these issues, for these and these similar programs, but it's coming from, from taxes. So, and also so it must come from anywhere so we have to think about how we can guarantee this this income in the future as well this also would require the public support as well uh, uh rohan would like to uh, comment please rohan 
Yeah, just a just a quick comment here, Larry. Just based off of uh, comments from Olaf, we talked about resilience as a concept. We also talked about over reliance on some large, big key players in the market. Uh, there might be a long-winded discussion for the pros and cons of it, but the way, just my two cents, the way I see it is uh, this uh, COVID pandemic is just one of the impetus that we can use as a reason to make some amends in our supply chains, uh, make things, uh, you know, a couple of things come to my mind as to how do we like, what, where do we go from here and how do we use this as an opportunity to to have more resilient, more scalable supply chains in the future so that if we are, God forbid, but if we are hit with another pandemic down the road, we know how to react and, and not have the same degree of disruption that we have seen uh, in this go around. So two things just want to touch upon is, one is supply chain flexibility. And I think Olaf made some comments around that uh, just from you know Amazon's perspective, or maybe even applicable for any large manufacturer, like developing and curating a list of uh, multiple sources that you can you know source some of your uh, core ASINs and some core products from, which are essential to run your business. So when one channel runs dry, you have another one to tap into, and we have seen that happen for Canada market. Uh, there was a period in time where we had issues getting the freight from China. Uh, and we had to just over rely on some of the local uh, vendors within Canada or even within the United States uh, and just to have a and have like a cross border transportation uh, as another option for us to procure the freight that we were looking for. Uh, and then the second thing, the second thing is, is scalability. Scalability, uh, I know we touched upon it a little bit, but that is another like big theme um, over at Amazon. Um, and this might be a little bit Amazon centric response, so I apologize, but just in terms of scaling up like fulfillment centers or even like uh, working with our trans partners, uh, such as Canada Post, uh, making sure there is capacity in every component of supply chain uh, that you can rely upon uh, as and when you can, you, you have the need and requirement to flex it uh, up and down based on what demand and supply signals we're looking at. So. Very relevant discussion, but just wanted to tie those those couple things into uh, a quick comment. Thank you. Thank you, Rohan. Atma? Thank you, Olaf. For, uh, hi, thank you, Olaf, for bringing this perspective into the discussion. Um, now, we all know that uh, over the last few decades, supply chains focused on cost effectiveness and cost minimization, uh, forgetting about resiliency and uh, sustainability. Um, and uh, over the last few months, since the start of the pandemic, I've been following the discussions uh, both uh, between academics and also with industry leaders. And um, the pandemic just shed the light on resiliency. So now people are thinking of how to introduce resiliency uh, together with cost eff uh, effective efficiency. And nobody's talking about uh, sustainability. So I don't think we make ourselves good if we come up with solutions after the pandemic that will allow for some degree of cost effectiveness and cost uh, and resiliency, but no sustainability because we're driving ourselves into an environmental crisis and we may go back to square one in a few years. So thanks Olaf and we need to keep reminding people that uh, now coming out of the pandemic and coming up with solutions to reboot their supply chains, they should take sustainability seriously. Thank you, Fatma. Uh, Jatin wishes to comment. Thank you. I, I want to reflect upon Olaf and Fatma's comments and Rohan's as well on this question of of uh, it is absolutely astounding if you think about it that a virus could bring the entire global economy on its knees and what that says to me is that we've created over the last number of decades a system that is extremely brittle that doesn't have the kind of robustness uh, that one would expect my major concern and i think both co colleagues have touched upon it is this not we've become a prisoners of optimization and primarily optimization of but one function cost of course that delivers proper good profits fair enough that's what a corporate uh, entity would want but if carried to the nth degree this just in time my uh, delivery has such limited flexibility with no storage storage in fact is our inventory is considered a completely negative factor from a cost perspective and you end up creating a system 
that delivers wonderful profits, but a minor perturbation in the system brings the whole house of cards down. And to that point, I would like to emphasize what Olaf is saying is that we need to get our mental models to a place that begin to optimize across a range of variables, including these high level societal perspectives of, of environment, uh, social governance and, 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 and factors that, so when you optimize it across a multi-level criteria and not but just one, uh, I think we may be in a better place. And today it's a, it's a virus, tomorrow it could be climate related threats that would come to pass. So we need a more resilient system for which we will have to learn how to pay for it. Uh, thank you, Jatine. I think the word brittle really describes the the, the current system that is um, uh, that is in place. Uh, we're moving to the conclusion of the time that we have. I would, however, like to offer each panelist um, a quick a sense or two comment about what they see as the most urgent issue, either directly arising out of um, uh, COVID or also the most uh, uh, important challenge. Uh, that they think is is just that's that is affecting the supply chains. Uh, Rohan, would you begin, please, briefly? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll keep my comments brief. The biggest thing that I see is is capacity, and what I mean by capacity is whether it's capacity of how much volume we can process the fulfillment network, uh, or how much product we can inbound from our, our upstream partners, or how much product we can ship out to our customers using our trans partners. Uh, capacity is something that doesn't scale up in a quick matter of time. So there are considerations that that companies such as Amazon are, are giving to, and, and I'm assuming or hoping uh, others in the industry will, will also give to uh, how to maintain capacity and what levers can be pulled to flex up and flex down the capacity, not only within your organization, but also upstream and downstream to your supply chain uh, in order to um, uh, address a pandemic such as the current one we are facing. So that's my two cents. Uh, thank you, Rohan. Final word? Uh, yep. Uh, thanks, Larry. Um, <laughs> it's hard to condense all of that I have in my brain into one word. So <laughs> I'm going to uh, talk about um, um, one concrete um, strategy, uh, which um, would be very useful uh, to complement what's been done. So this is operational con concrete and, and uh, could be very helpful uh, to supply chain uh, executives. Um, and um, so if you think about uh, all of the creative strategies that uh, have been put in place recently, uh, like using new technologies, 3D printing, um, manufacturers uh, repurposing their production capabilities to produce different products, for example, brewers moving to producing hand sanitizers and so on and so forth. These are great. Uh, but so far, all of these initiatives focused on the production side. Uh, but we know that logistics and supply chains is about getting the right product to the right place at the right time. So making masks uh, by uh, GM is one step. Delivering them to where they are needed is uh, another step and it is as important. Uh, so what I'm trying to suggest here is uh, to make use of uh, all the capabilities of supply chains, uh, not just the um, uh, production capabilities. Uh, so for example, um, What's, what people are resorti resorting to is express delivery. And we know that, for example, Canada Post, Amazon distribution capabilities are overworked. They're working over capacity to the point that they are delaying or, or even canceling non-essential deliveries, which is, of course, a lost opportunity in terms of income. On the other hand, there is other supply chains that are um, operating at uh, very low levels of capacity, and we should try and make use of those uh, especially those that are willing. For example, I'm going to give you uh, some work that we, we are doing now uh, at our uh, Waterloo Analytics and Optimization Lab. Uh, we're developing solutions uh, that uh, will make use of the auto automotive aftermarket supply chain 
to assist the government in the distribution of uh, PPE. Uh, we are collaborating with industrial part partners Uniselect, which is a national automotive aftermarket supply chain, um, and uh, Mr. Transmission, who are leading the project, and Chor Consulting, who work in the health domain and will build the complete end-to-end -end distribution solution uh, that will use the optimization tools we, we will develop, we're, we're developing. Um, so I want to... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll have to ask the, the other panelists. I'm sorry, we're just okay. we're no problem for time. Thank you very much, Jatin. Thank you, Larry. I will be brief. I'll pick up on Rohan's idea of capacity, but I'll take it to a different level. I'm thinking of in terms of the urgent challenge in front of us here is what I would call the global financial capacity. Uh, if COVID-19 denudes that to a substantial extent, that would in fact take us to a brittle world where we will not be able to deal with uh, more threatening challenges that climate is about to deliver uh, us. So we ought not to be completely mesmerized by COVID, that's one. And in, 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 in terms of, of uh, suggestion or, or, or a way to think about this, uh, particularly at the CEO levels of corporate entities, is begin to think in terms of investment for resiliency within your organization and your, your supply chain and, and others that whom you interact with. That will take us to a much better world. And of course, when the governments uh, begin to turn their mind as to uh, creating a more resilient world on, on, on broader infrastructure aspects and so on. So that's the key. But my worry is that COVID might denude the financial capacity for us to do things we need to do. Thank you, Jatin. Olaf? Um, yeah, maybe the first really short term is probably guaranteeing a safe environment for all employers and others involved in the supply chain that's that's still not guaranteed and and for me a part of the supply chain is is healthcare elderly homes you know we have these massive problems there. so we have to do that and to achieve that uh, kind of middle midterm is we have to come up with with good indicators to to uh, evaluate all component all participants of the of the supply chain so environmental social indicators economic indicators I just read a, as an example, the Fortune magazine had a list of the best COVID employees and, and, and one of the great outstanding things that they mentioned, exceptional is um, one employee paid sick leave if people got COVID. I think, you know, we cannot use these types of indicators in the future anymore. We have to come up with really, with really good ways to evaluate all participants in the supply chain that we can make sure that 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 it is uh, sustainable environmentally and socially. Thank, thank you, Olaf. Uh, as we move to conclusion, I'd like to thank all of the uh, participants, our panelists, and also our visitors. We will do a Q and A um, after two o'clock, uh, so the panelists will still be available uh, for that session. Uh, uh, but otherwise, we appreciate your interest. We are offering you food for thought from different perspectives on this vital uh, subject um, of the global supply chains. Uh, Bridget. Well, thanks very much, Larry and everyone. Um, I would like to actually very much thank the audience for joining us today. And, and just, I want to encourage the audience to please stay tuned for the Q&A, <clears throat> which will begin momentarily and remind the audience that uh, to submit a question, simply click on the small Q&A in the bottom right corner of your screen and ensure you choose all panelists before you begin typing. Um, and please know that your question won't be seen by the full audience. It will be seen only by those uh, operating this uh, WebEx webinar. So a very big thank you to Professor Larry Smith for moderating the discussion today. And as well as a, a big thank you to our panelists, Shatin, Fatma, Olaf, uh, Rohan. You know, your insights and expertise were extremely valuable on this very um, important topic that is affecting every aspect of our lives from, you know, business, personally, individually, groups, all of it. So um, the varying uh, perspectives were, were really fascinating. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to um, share my contact information here briefly for you. And um, say that if you, if you do have any further questions or you heard something today that intrigued you to explore further, 
I invite you to, to connect with me, uh, Bridget Maloney, at the email shown on the screen. For those not familiar with JADI, it is the gateway for enterprises to discover innovation at the University of Waterloo. So I'd like to point out that our next um, really interesting panel in this series of six panel weekly panel sessions we're running is on June 2nd, and the topic is rebooting security and data privacy considerations. And simply go to uwaterloo.ca slash Jedi slash events for more information on that and for registration. And we really look forward to seeing you then Okay, so so welcome to this Q&A portion of the session. And I'd really like to thank the audience who have already been submitting questions. In fact, before the hour started um, during registration phase of this webinar. Um, so I've been provided with a selection of questions to put to the panel. Um, and all the panelists, including Larry as moderator, you're welcome to contribute to the discussion of the question. We'll, we'll try and keep answers somewhat short to allow a maximum number of questions in this half hour period. And I, I have the first question that I'd like to direct to um, actually to Fatma. Um, so um, Fatma, do you feel that just in time delivery and pull based manufacturing will be gone in a post COVID world or perhaps only in certain sectors? Thanks, Bridget. Um, this is a great question um, and it ties in very well with the discussion that we've uh, been having. Uh, a few of the panelists, they mentioned the idea of redundancy, uh, which is country to just in time. Um, so the success uh, behind our modern supply chains is going lean, um, uh, uh, single sourcing consolidation, um, which do not allow for redundancy. Um, so the question is, uh, in order to uh, build resiliency in supply chains, should we uh, be adding redundancy and in that way getting um, away from uh, these just-in-time policies? And uh, my answer is that's not necessarily the best approach. Um, one of the reasons is go now in the recovery, supply chains are going to be operating with very little cash flow. Uh, they would be operating probably under uh, very hard conditions. So it is not reasonable to ask executives to tie in cash in, for example, extra inventories or in opening new warehouses or creating redundancy in the supply chain. But there is a better solution and that's uh, using digital networks. So now we have all the technology, the telecom technology, we have the information, we have all the capability to uh, create the digital networks. So we're talking about a digital uh, twin of the supply chain. So companies, instead of creating redundancy, they should instead work on mapping their supply chains and map mapping their supply networks um, so that they get better visibility um, and when they have that available, then one, they can also acquire information um, about future risks. There's companies that pro provide those services. And also they can continuously monitor their supply chain through the digital one by, you know, running stress tests, what happens, you know, what if analysis and so on and so forth. So that's a cheaper alternative that will enable visibility and provide a lot of resilience to the supply chain without add, without getting rid of the uh, successful strategies of just in time. Thank you, thank you, Fatma. So um, I'd like to go to the next question, and let let's go to Jatin for this one. Um, Jatin, how can U of W students contribute to this to this work? Um, either classrooms or as co-op experiences to prepare oneself for working in the supply chain side of businesses? Thank you, Bridget. Uh, I make a general observation. We've talk, been talking of uh, uh, resiliency. Uh, if I think of University of Waterloo students, uh, they bring to the table an enormous capacity of flexibility of mind, ability to to actually zero in on what is the core problem and issues of problem solving, which is what they learn when both in class as well as when they go out to work uh, with companies. Uh, and so they, they bring 
a, a degree of flexibility and, and, and robustness and resilience uh, and, and there, with it, the capacity to actually deal with situations that are new, that are unknown, that are not just a run of the mill standard experience. So in, in that sense, I think they bring a very powerful set of uh, skill sets and expertise for any employer anywhere, doesn't, and doesn't matter, you don't need to specify that. And they come across from all disciplines, right? You know, whether it's engineering or computer and mathematics or environment or, or for that matter, even the faculty of arts, the breadth of thinking and capacity is really what they bring to the table. And I think that's, that's what they do. Thank you, Jatin. Um, Larry, over to you for a question, and then Rohan uh, after that. So, um, Larry, how can we move to internalizing supply chains and their costs, given the WTO rulings contrary to this? Oh, well, that's a, oh my goodness, you've lobbed at me. Uh, um, it, that's an ex extraordinary challenge. Uh, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is itself under siege as the United States chooses to try to sabotage everything it's doing of every kind. So what is happening right now on our planet, which is not helpful for environmental sustainability, for building, re uh, for building uh, resilience, for building even redundancy, is that the regulatory regime, which is to say the regulations among countries, which are the trading regulations, um, I think we could view them, uh, some of those regulations as, as deficient, I believe Olaf would, but it doesn't change the fact that now there's an attack on the whole idea of regulation of every, of, of every kind, which is exceptionally unhelpful, because now you, you, you have an, a situation in which one country tries to benefit the, o, over the other country, the classic beggar thy neighbor type of policy, from the, and, and, it, and it's a flashback to the 1930s. Whatever else we need to deal with the current situation, which is the pandemic, and that does not change the fact that climate change remains a, a fundamental challenge that is, is, is entirely separate from, is separate from this. And that the, the idea that we would regulate our activities among countries, which of course also implies people in individuals, with, sorry, within, within countries, um, that idea is under siege by several of the major players. And the other one is China also, which believes it's exempt to any rule it chooses not to follow. Uh, so to have two of the largest societies on earth going rogue on us is exceptionally unhelpful. I feel bad now having said that. So. <laughs> Valid points. Th thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. So. Um, Rohan, over to you. Um, and it's a, it's somewhat of a follow up question to the one uh, I asked Jatine. But could you briefly describe your path into the supply chain side of Amazon? This might, you know, be of interest to students who are graduating and building their career. So is it something you directly trained for, or something you just happened to get into? Uh, sure. Let me try to ramble my way through this one. Uh, thanks, Bridget. So. Uh, I did my master's in, in uh, industrial engineering and logistics uh, from Georgia Tech, and that was sort of my formal introduction or formal training to supply chain as a, as a topic. Um, from there, I worked in uh, supply chain consulting uh, world for about three years uh, with a company called Deloitte Consulting, if you heard the name. And then uh, for the last, uh, I believe, nine years or so, I worked with a third-party logistics company called APU Logistics, uh, which, you know, focusing on transportation warehousing services, so uh, designing warehouses and uh, coming up with operational metrics as to how to run them and how to maintain some of the uh, key uh, performance indicators uh, to make sure the warehouse and operation are running healthy. And then from there on, I sort of switched over to the Amazon world uh, a little over 14 months now. Uh, and so throughout my career, the focus has been supply chain. Uh, the type, supply chain is such a broad concept and obviously it's such a big topic that which aspect of supply chain you, you touch upon uh, sort of varies from one company to another and how it's being looked upon as a 
um, as a, as a as a way to compete against other uh, competitors in the market. Uh, so within Amazon, my focus has always been on the on the Canada on the on the Canada market. Uh, Canada is is obviously a very important market for us. So my role and my focus is on launching some of the new FCs we have coming up with. Uh, there's one coming up in Montreal. Uh, there's one we are launching in Toronto and one in Calgary this year. Um, those are the three ones I can think of and I can speak to publicly. <laughs> Uh, and then also uh, ma making sure that we have a good balance between matching up the supply and demand, uh, supply from our customers, and then making sure our fulfillment centers are stocked up with the right inventory so we can fulfill the, so we can fulfill the demand. So if the students have any questions in terms of like any specific uh, aspect of sort of my career path, uh, I'm sure mine is not the only way to get to a certain point within the supply chain as a uh, as a as a profession, uh, feel free to share my information to them. I'll be happy to help as much as I can. Uh, Amazon, obviously, shameless plug here is 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 hiring, uh, and we are looking to scale up operations in Canada and, and also in the U.S. in the headquarters in Seattle, where I'm based off. Uh, so, if there are opportunities that the students are, are interested in in pursuing and discussing, feel free to reach out to me. We'll be happy to help. Well, thank you, Rohan. And you might you might just get a flood of questions. So <laughs> hopefully not. I am prepared. <laughs> but thank you very much for that uh, offering. That that's very kind and, and generous of you. Um, so um, thanks, Rohan. So um, Olaf, over to you. Um, we'll start by directing this question to you, but then uh, open it up to the panel. It comes from Eric, who is the senior manager of supply chain and logistics for the company Inksmith, uh, or also who, who makes the, the Canadian Shield. And I think we all have heard of this in, in the news, uh, which is a great initiative. So during the heart of this crisis, um, this is so this is quoted from Eric. During the heart of this crisis, we worked hard to create a brand brand new supply chain for PPE manufacturing. We very fr frequently ran into fear from suppliers about working with a new company. Fears included supplier goods being mis misused or misrepresented, uh, uh, payment issues. So there were many long calls uh, that were needed to resolve these issues, and there was a scarcity of willing suppliers. How could a newer or reborn organizations help suppliers overcome these fears and push toward uh, forward with reopening the economy. Um, maybe you know, coming back to to my answer to the first question, from my point of view, it could be um, um, uh, being transparent, disclosing disclosing uh, transparently, and using doing this in a standardized way. So if suppliers know, okay, we have a certain way that companies disclose their information. Uh, it can be even payment. It can be social and other economic issues it's always the same if we have a certain standard then this creates uh, confidence uh, with, with suppliers and it makes it easy from both sides you know suppliers could do the same if i'm looking for a supplier it would be great if i see in a standardized way these are the indicators that how the supplier is performing and then i that's easier to, to pick something someone Thank you. And that is a, you know, it's quite a um, involved question. So is there anyone else who would like to comment on that on the panel? Please feel free to speak up as I, I don't see a, a digital raised hand with my view. Um, maybe Bridget, I'll, I'll just make a brief, um, brief comment uh, because it has been extraordinarily distressing for me uh, to see that this um, pandemic, which is a true crisis, there'd be no, that's not a misuse of the word. Uh, what has happened, as happens in so many circumstances, is every bottom crawling, creep, swindler, embezzler has, has, is taking action. So the reason that there are, is reluctance of new players, I mean, to trust them, is that there are, in fact, a lot of scams going on. So the challenge of a legitimate new company, a, a, a new initiative, as the questioner asked about, it is a really great problem that they face. And it's being exacerbated by all these other creeps who create so much noise in the marketplace. 
they actually slow down the ability of any genuine business to adapt to these new opportunities and to these new needs. And, and, and yeah, I'm an economist, so I'm always the dismal guy. I have, I have to say to the questioner that it is, it is just soldier on. It is guerrilla type marketing where you just have to make the argument again and again. Uh, transparency, as Olaf said, is a huge, uh, huge deal since the scamsters pretend they're doing transparency and of course are doing the absolute reverse. Um, but you unfortunately will have to prove your trustworthiness and there's no necessarily magic way to do it. And th these are difficult times because other people are making it more difficult for you. Um, and I just urge you to you know, fight the fight. Right. Thank you, Larry. Anyone, would anyone else like to comment? May I, may I make a comment as well? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you step back a bit and you think here, isn't it absolutely astounding that a, a country with full proper governance, a complete ability to do just about anything it wished, uh, is not able to deliver face masks? And we're not looking at uh, delivering millions of uh, highly uh, sophisticated lasers for brain surgery or something along those lines that we've, we've been brought to our knees. And what this says to me is that we have developed both a political and a business culture that lacks trust, that we have somehow allowed ourselves in the pursuit of a, of a very rigorous, uh, let's call it cost op op optimization or profit maximization, a, a, an approach that that uh, is pulling at the threads of uh, how we as a society should really begin to respond. Because tomorrow's problem is not going to be a virus, it'll be something else. And, 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 and so we need to really think through very strategically in terms of, of uh, how we deal with this and not be mesmerized by whether it's the vaccine or the mask or, or the respirators and, and that that's the only failing of the system. Thank you, Jatin. Bridget, uh, can I add something? Fatma. Um, so uh, my answer is more on the um, long run side. Um, probably one of the lessons from uh, this pandemic is that sometimes collaboration can be very helpful and actually it, it is always very helpful. Uh, so maybe in coming up with innovative solutions, we should be thinking of uh, developing frameworks um, to allow for what, what I would like to call a super network, uh, a, a network or an ecosystem of supply chains um, that have the trust and the mechanism set, set so that um, there is, uh, they allow the exchanges between the supply chains um, exchanging production capabilities, distribution capabilities, uh, creation probabilities, uh, capabilities, and so on and so forth, so that, um, uh, you know, uh, the um, question that was answered now wouldn't be relevant in the future because there will be already a framework through which a new company can enter a market in a time of crisis. Maybe to add at the, at the end, you know, also this crisis is not very surprising you know if you look on world economic forum risk analysis since 10 years we have a pandemic on that and you know there's this discussion of, of bill gates why could he know you know of course everybody knew in 2015 already that's a big risk so it's nothing that we ran into it total you know we could have prepared for that and the question is how can we prepare for other things and and we can use this grid for, for World Economic Forum and see it. And there are more risk, frightening risks there as well. And maybe we should think about how we how we can prepare for, for these risks. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. Th thank you, everyone. So I'll move on to the next question. A couple of new questions have come in from the from the audience. Um, so audience question uh, for Fatma. Um, do you have any thoughts around decentralized supply chain versus centralized and global versus local market strategies for corporations? Um, yeah, so again, these are all uh, strategies that uh, supply chain executives can think of uh, in order to bring in resilience in their supply chains. Decentralizing will allow, um, you know, uh, 
uh, forbidding the supply, the whole supply chain from collapsing and, you know, isolating the different components of the supply chain. Um, so that if one uh, event happens at some place, the rest of the supply chain is, is fine. Um, except that with the scale of this pandemic, um, I don't think decentralized supply chains are any safer than centralized supply chains. Every supply chain is impacted um, to a large extent. Um, so um, it's more about um, setting the objectives right. Um, so in deciding whether our supply chain should be centralized or decentralized, we shouldn't be only thinking about cost minimization, but also thinking about building in resiliency, sustainability, um, you know, social aspects of supply chains. All of these should be um, into our equation to decide uh, the best trade-offs between all of these. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma. So another audience question came in. Um, I'm gonna, we're going to direct this one at Jatin. Um, so with the reboot of the Canadian economy post COVID-19, do you see a change in our geographical sourcing strategies? Um, so specifically, are we going to see a lot more sourcing in Canada and the US as opposed to overseas? I am not a predictor, obviously, but one would expect that uh, uh, some serious thinking would have to go in uh, to answering the question, what is truly strategic and what is truly, call it in the national interest, uh, some red lines you can draw where you say you cannot allow yourself to be vulnerable on A, B and C. And I don't know what all those are, but we will have to do some, some serious soul searching to, to allow us to get there. Uh, and uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, whether in Canada geographic uh, uh, considerations of, uh, you know, supply chains and so on, as opposed to from external uh, to Canada, I think it's an open question. And really, I, I don't have a strong view on that, but we will see some, some serious uh, thinking about uh, uh, this question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jatin. Um, okay, so can I add something to this? If yes. you have time, if uh, we have time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I just want to give a, a simple example. So suppose you have a bottle of water and you put some sand and then you shake it and then suddenly everything is messed up and you think, oh, when it settles down, the water is going to turn some color. But when it settles down, the water is still water, so it's not changing. And so what we're living here is is a, a big big shake to the whole system and uh, we're thinking that things are going to change dramatically um, we are hoping that change, um, things should change in in the betterment of our socioeconomic, socioeconomic systems but i don't think there's going to be a fundamental change in the way we do things uh, we're humans and we forget thank you thank you fatma any additional comments before I move to the next question? I did want to get back to the decentralization uh, versus central question. This is a very powerful emerging trend within the energy sector, and there's a debate about whether one is good or the other. Uh, and, and I think it's now dawned upon most uh, involved in the sector and thinking about the strengths of decentralization that we can begin to use digital technologies in a way that decentralized uh, energy systems, uh, which is local or at the consumer uh, level, uh, it can be very effective in actually introducing and stabilizing the bigger grid. So they don't have to work at cross purposes, but you can actually begin to make them uh, reinforce and play with each other. So this mm -hmm. centralized versus decentralized doesn't have, we have to be an either or option, but one can say centralized and decentralized, uh, and you 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 pick the 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 uh, the attributes that best, best enhance the system. Interesting point. Thank you. Thank you, Jatin. So, Larry, back to you. Um, economies of scale are at the core of successful supply chain management. And this means that concentration, for example, um, an example company would be Amazon, Rohan. Concentration is efficient, but at the same time, there are concerns about too much concentration in the distribution market. So, for example, what happens to the mom and pop shops? Um, these concerns have been magnified considerably by the pandemic. 
what types of policy should be put in place to address these inequality concerns? Well, I begin by saying they're absolutely real concerns. There's no doubt about it. Smaller uh, companies have been particularly stressed during this time because they have limited financial resources, limited uh, networks to draw upon. So yes, the smaller enterprises are at considerable risk. Thank goodness that we at least have a company with Shopify trying to, you know, at least provide some assistance to the local, uh, to the local retailer and a, also a local company fair is trying to facilitate connections uh, between merchants and smaller producers. So th th there is some technology, there are some uh, companies trying to serve um, the, the, the smaller, more vulnerable marketplaces. But your premise here of the question is still absolutely the case. We're, we have been for the last two decades in a period of consolidation where we were looking for economies of scale. Now, some of those economies of scale are driven by legitimate you know, uh, efficiencies produced through the supply chain. And some of that concentration is driven solely by financial engineering that has absolutely nothing to do with producing effective products, but to achieve price control or price dominance by the companies trying to consolidate themselves. So sometimes consolidation is for true production efficiency. Sometimes it's just to enhance financial performance. Sometimes, of course, it is for both. So how would you deal with it? Well, what we should deal with is, in, is enforce aggressively the laws of Canada and the United States has the same laws, but enforce them aggressively, which are the pro-competition laws. We've got to stop allowing competitors to buy each other, for example, and just get even uh, bigger. Uh, in, in the olden days, uh, we used to actually take um, pro-competition rules seriously. In a, and those pro-competition rules inherently leaned in the favor of the smaller enterprises and it was in it was seen to be in society's benefit that there should be more competition rather than less to restrain the abuses of the powers of the large. Now that child, there are in this brief period of time. Let me just begin by acknowledging that there are also some, some deficiencies of the of the of relying on competition to discipline the marketplace. But to remove that discipline from the marketplace is is to exacerbate everything, including environmental challenges. It does not change Olaf's point that we need aggressively enforced environmental standards. And the, the simple fact of the matter is the, the theory of the marketplace from Adam Smith forward has always presumed there was a regulatory environment within which enterprises were competing. Uh, there is no, there is no uh, mainstream economics does not take that the natural state of ideal marketplaces are no regulations. There has always been the belief that there should be a profound set of regulations and some of them very systemic, having to do with the laws of property, the ability to do incorporation. And I have a three and a half hour lecture um, on that topic, which I'll stop now. Thank you. <laughs> Th thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. So this brings us to our close. I, I want to thank again the audience for your participa participation, but a, an especially big thank you to Larry as moderator and Jatin, Fatma, Olaf, and, and Rohan um, as panelists for answering the questions and engaging in this lively discussion. It's been very informative and enlightening, and these are very topical matters. Thank you very much. So um, if, if the audience has any further questions or perhaps you heard something today that intrigued you to explore further, uh, again, I invite you to reach out to me, Bridget Maloney. I'll share the uh, screen showing the upcoming. Um, there you should be seeing the upcoming session. So our next panel is uh, Tuesday, June 2nd, and it's rebooting security and data privacy considerations is the topic. Um, please again, go to uwaterloo.ca slash Jedi slash events for information and registration. And um, so we look forward to seeing you then. Uh, this closes our session for today. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you again to the moderator and panelists. And I say goodbye. <laughs>